uh, which is celebrating the legacy of Emmy Neuther. My talk is aimed at graduate students of physics. So you will see that it is really very simple, but I believe also quite profound. Uh, Neuther was primarily a mathematician. Her paper of 1918, titled Invariant Variational Pro Variation Problems, turned out to be of great significance for physics. So the two talks that Professor Joseph Samuel of Raman Research Institute and I are going to give, they are related and they are both inspired by this paper of, um, of Neuther. So first of all, I want to show you the uh, details where, in which journal this paper was published. This is this, sorry, I have to get used to this thing. One moment. Ah, uh, this is the journal in which it was published. I don't know how to read this. It's a pretty long title. And, but the, uh, the journal name is pretty complicated. I don't even know how to pronounce it. The paper itself is called Invariant Variation Problems. Uh, and I have been told that the work was done by her by around 1915, but it was finally published three years later. Now the aims of this paper are very clearly stated by Neuther. Earlier, the mathematician Sophus Lee had studied the following problem. Suppose you are given some system of partial differential equations, what are the continuous groups of transformations which preserve those equations? So this study of Lie was, in fact, the origin of the idea of abstract Lie groups, which is a very important part of mathematics. Noether posed the following problem. If the partial differential equations come from a variational principle, then what are the special consequences that follow? So you can see her aim was to combine two things. The calculus of variations developed by Euler and Lagrange in the 18th century, and Lee's theory of continuous groups which preserve given differential equations. And her idea was to take these two ideas, put them together, and see what are the important consequences. So you can see that what she did was a special but very important case coming under Sophus Lee's general study. Now, I will describe the framework used by Neuther in her paper using the language of physics. And later on, for my, own, my purposes in this talk, I am going to simplify it drastically. So the framework used by her is what we would call in physics classical local field theory. Let me see if I can handle this. The mathematical quantities involved are of two kinds, what we would call space-time variables, x mu, and then a set of functions of x mu, which are thought of as local fields, u alpha of x. So we have these two kinds of things. And then for any domain you choose in the space of the space-time or independent variables, you have an action which is an integral over that domain of some given function which depends on all these arguments. The space, the independent variables x, the fields u, the first partial derivatives of u, the second partial derivatives of u, and so on up to some finite uh, degree. Okay. And when you make a variation of the fields in the definition of the action, the, the condition that the action should be stationary leads to the familiar Euler-Lagrange variational principles of the calculus of variations, which in physics we call equations of motion, EOM. So the equations of motion from this action <coughs> principle are expressed as follows. There are certain expressions psi which are formed out of this function f, 
They are called the Lagrange expressions. And here they are. The first term, the leading term, is partial derivative of f with respect to any one of the u's. Then the next term involves what I have written here, the dependence on du by dx appears here. Then the next third term would involve the dependence of f on the second derivatives of u, and so on. So these psi alphas are called the Lagrange expressions associated with this action. And the equations of motion, the equations of the calculus of variations, say that these Lagrange expressions should vanish. So this is the basic equation. Now, Noether considers two kinds of transformations which preserve the form of the action. Previous, yeah? Something not clear? Equation two is the result of requiring that the action should be, sorry, I'm pressing the wrong button here, sorry. Equation two is a result of demanding that this expression, the action in any domain D should be, in, should be unchanged to first order when you make an infinitesimal change in the use. What do you mean by what kind of change? You replace u of x by u of x plus delta u of x, where you assume that delta u's are sufficiently often differentiable, and they and their derivatives vanish on the boundary of the domain. When? Yeah, yeah, right, right. Right. Is what not always? Is what not always true? Sorry, I can Stationarity is a demand you put. And then from that demand on this action functional, you get a certain system of partial differential equations. This is derived from this stationarity uh, demand. All right? Is it clear? I think we can come back to it later if there are questions. Now, she considers two kinds of transformations which preserve the action. And I just described the kinds of transformations here. The first kind are transformations of the following, sorry, um, general form, where you take your independent axis, which I call in physics language space-time coordinates, and you take the fields, local fields u, replace the axis by y's, which are allowed in her treatment to be functions of x, functions of u, even of the partial derivatives of u. Similarly, replace the old local fields u of x by v of y, which are also permitted to be functions of all these quantities. But you, the first kind of transformation she considers is that in which this set of transformations depends on a finite number of independent parameters. That is the first kind of transformation she considers and asks for such transformations, what can you say if it has to preserve the action and therefore it has to preserve the equations of motion? That is the field equations. In physics terminology, we would call these global symmetries. So the transformation depends on a <coughs> finite number of independent parameters. The second kind of transformation she allows or considers is, uh, where is it? type two? I think from this angle I'm not, ah, here it is. The second kind is where the expressions for y and v of y are allowed to depend on some number of independent arbitrary functions of x. That is a key idea. So that's a second kind of transformation she considers. And they also are supposed to, they have to have the property that they preserve the action. So these are what in modern physics language we would call gauge type symmetries of the equations of motion. Okay? Beg your pardon? The second one. 
where there are arbitrary functions of x in the transformation equations. Yeah, just for a physical example, suppose you have a system on which rotations in physical space make sense. A rotation is defined by three parameters. They are not functions of position, they are constants with respect to space itself. So those would be of the global type. Where there are arbitrary functions in the equations of transformation, they would be of the gauge type. So in both cases, she assumes that the transformations are elements of a continuous group. And in between these two types, she also mentions a particularly simple case, which is this type, where the new independent variables y are functions only of x's, not of the field variables. And the v of y are functions of x and u of x without higher derivatives of u of x. This is just as a simple particular case. Now she proves two basic theorems and their inverses, and they are the following. If the original system of partial differential equations following from the variational principle have a symmetry of the type one, then for each one of these independent parameters, there is a corresponding conservation law in the physics language, local conservation law, in her language, a divergence theorem. A divergence of some set of components adds up to zero. That is for the transformations of the first kind. For transformations of the second kind, the gauge type involving arbitrary functions of x, the conclusion of the theorem is that the so-called Lagrange expressions Psi alpha, which I think I can go back. Sorry. This is ultra sensitive. I have to get used to it. These expressions, when they are zero, you have your equations, field equations. The second type of symmetry of the equations, if it is there, it shows that these Lagrange expressions are not independent, algebraically independent of one another. Okay, so this is the, uh, so these are the two theorems that are proved and their inverses are also proved. Now, practically every good book on classical field theory or quantum field theory written for physicists mentions the simplest case of the first Noether theorem. Generally, this is what is done. And then, in the rest of the book, there is not much mention of Noether. It is just used. It is given in the initial stages. The rest of the book usually goes on to other things. Now, my aim in this talk is to simplify this discussion to the case of mechanics rather than field theory. But I, uh, believe me, the essential points will remain valid. So let me go to my uh, special case. In place of the multidimensional space of independent variables, x's, I have just one independent time variable. And in place of local fields, you have, as in ordinary mechanics, classical dynamics, you have a set of generalized coordinates q, and I number them by an index j taking n values, and each one of them is a function of the independent time variable. Then, in the sense of Lagrangian mechanics, I assume that I have a Lagrangian, a function L, which depends only on the coordinates, generalized coordinates Q, and their first time derivatives. I do not consider the case of higher time derivatives, because for most physical systems, this is what is uh, relevant. Then. In this simplified situation, my aim will be the following. Connect up Noether's theorems, both theorems, with the concepts of Hamiltonian dynamics. That is not there in her work, and I want to uh, show you how it works out. In the case of transformations of the gauge type, where arbitrary functions of the variables, independent variables, appear in the transformation, I want to show you 
how you can connect her results to the Dirac treatment of what is called generalized Hamiltonian dynamics. And as I said, these aspects are not covered in her paper, but I want to round it uh, up in this way. So now let me uh, start with the Lagrangian and its uh, properties. For a system with given number of degrees of freedom and coordinates, assume that a Lagrangian L depending on q and q dot is given. And I assume for simplicity there is no explicit time dependence. And also to begin with, I assume that there are no constraints on the Lagrangian. What does this mean? It means that a certain symmetric, real symmetric matrix called the Hessian matrix formed out of these second partial derivatives, d2l by dq dot dq dot, this symmetric real matrix is non-singular, okay? So this is the case that is normally taught in classical mechanics courses. The Lagrange expressions which we had for a system of fields now becomes a set of expressions depending on Q, first time derivatives, the velocities, second time derivatives, the accelerations, and they have this expression in mechanics, dl by dq, minus the time derivative of dl by dq dot. And so you have these Lagrange expressions, one for each independent coordinate q. And the equations of motion, that is the result of imposing the variational principle, are that these Lagrange expressions should all vanish. So here are the equations of motion for a classical dynamical system. Now let me consider infinitesimal transformations of the coordinates Q, and I will consider two types of transformations. The first type is, so, sorry, my, this is going extremely sensitive, all right. So here is the idea of a transformation. You have a set of functions Q dependent on time, change them to Q prime of T, each one of them is q of t plus a small infinitesimal addition, delta q of t, where the, this is a function of time also. And the two types of transformations I want to consider are, first type, each delta q is a parameter epsilon, which is infinitesimal. It tells you it's an infinitesimal change, multiplied by some function of the q's and possibly also time. So this is one kind of infinitesimal transformation I will consider. The other kind is where you allow the change in every Q at any time to depend not only on Q at that time, but also on the velocities Q dot at that time. So these are the two kinds of infinitesimal transformations. And for definiteness, I want to clarify, the time variable is kept constant. It is not varied in this process. So as I said, the epsilon is an infinitesimal parameter telling you that it is an infinitesimal change. And the functions phi, which in the first case depend only on Q, in the second also on Q dot, they tell you how the variables Q change. They determine the transformation for you or they, you have a transformation in mind, means you have a definite set of functions, phi of this type or of that type. So in the first case, in physics terminology, we call it a point transformation. In the second case, you go beyond point transformations. So if you like, you can say this is of a kinematical kind, and this one is dynamical. In either case, we say that this transformation is a symmetry for our physical system, an infinitesimal symmetry, if the change that you get for the Lagrangian has the form of a total time derivative. That is, when you compute delta, the change in the Lagrangian, given this change in Q, take all the terms that you end up with, you find that they can all be combined into this form parameter epsilon standing outside, total time derivative of some function of q in this case and some function of q, q dot in the other case. 
point transformation, beyond point transformation. So you have a symmetry for a given Lagrangian under this transformation if there is some function f which allows you to write the change in the Lagrangian in this form, a total time derivative. There is a rule of Lagrangian mechanics in computing the change in the Lagrangian. The changes in q dot are the time derivatives of the changes in q. That's a standard rule of Lagrangian mechanics. I think I should speed up a little bit. So if the Lagrangian behaves in this way under the given transformation, the effect on the action you can easily see is that the change in the action involves only boundary terms, terms at the initial time and the final time. Now we bring in the variables called momenta, canonical momenta, which is the basic idea of Hamiltonian mechanics. This is a key step in the Hamiltonian form of dynamics. For each coordinate Q, we have a corresponding momentum variable P. So all together we have two N of them, which define what is called the phase space of the physical system. Then a fairly straightforward, easy analysis shows that the existence of a symmetry in the sense I have described here means four important consequences. And I list them one by one. The first consequence, so here's a list of the consequences of an infinitesimal symmetry. The first consequence is that when the equations of motion are obeyed, then there is a certain expression which has the property that it is a constant of motion. A certain expression g of q and p and time turns out to be preserved numerically in the course of time as the equations of motion are obeyed. And the expression for this constant of motion is given here. So it is obtained out of the action of the transformation on the variables and that piece which came in the total time derivative for the change in the Lagrangian. So existence of a constant of motion for a given symmetry is the first important consequence. Of course, this is Noether's theorem part one, you know, constant parameter case. The second important consequence, and here I go beyond what is in her uh, paper, there is a natural way to define changes in the momentum variables for such a transformation. So given Q and P, delta Q is already with us. It tells you how the transformation changes the coordinates. There is a natural and easy way to define, to go with delta Q, changes in momentum. And once you calculate that as well, you find that the overall system of changes in Qs and Ps is an infinitesimal canonical transformation. If the transformation was of the point type, then you know the definition of delta P is very, very elementary. Otherwise, if it's a dynamical symmetry, you may have you will have to use the equations of motion to calculate delta P. In either case, the fact that this action of the infinitesimal symmetry is a canonical transformation is the key second result. Some question? Well, I have not defined what a canonical transformation is, but that would take me too far into, again, if time permits later, we can discuss. So it is not, this is not an empty statement. It's a something that you, first, delta Q is given, it's a symmetry. Delta P is defined in a natural way. And you find that this overall change in phase space, transformation in phase space, is a canonical transformation, of course, infinitesimal. The third result that you find is that this canonical transformation is generated by the constant of motion. So you find that from this 
function g, which is constant in the course of time, delta q's can be obtained by this expression, delta p's can be obtained in this way, where these curly brackets are the well-known Poisson brackets, which uh, every physicist uh, student studies in classical mechanics. All right? And the last fourth uh, important consequence is that this canonical transformation preserves the equations of motion if they are written in Hamiltonian form. So most of you must have had courses in classical mechanics. I hope you see how it connect, connects up with things which you have studied there. So all in all, what we have is what I would like to call a symmetry triangle. And let me describe it very briefly. You start with an infinitesimal transformation delta Q, which happens to be a symmetry for a given Lagrangian. Therefore, the change in the Lagrangian has the form of a total time derivative. First consequence of this symmetry, there is an associated constant of motion. That is what Noether's theorem gives you. Second consequence of the symmetry is that the action of this transformation on phase space can be defined, can be computed, and when it is computed, it happens to be a canonical transformation, which is a non-trivial property. And the next property is that this canonical transformation, like any canonical transformation, is generated by a phase space function, and the generator is the constant of motion itself. So what I would like to emphasize, especially for students, is that all the three legs of this triangle can be established by direct computation. None of it is difficult, but none of it is trivial either. That's what I would like to convey. And this kind of presentation of Noether's theorem, as far as I know, is generally absent in courses in classical mechanics. In most books of mechanics of the older variety also, it is not there. My feeling is that this is really very deep and profound. And the fact that I'm using the notations of mechanics, finite number of degrees of freedom doesn't matter. Uh, it has all the essential ideas that you would find in a field theory also. So that's why it is really deep and profound. In particular, I want to emphasize that in the phase space formulation, you start with a symmetry, you obtain a constant of motion thanks to Noether. Then you find that the transformation itself is generated by that constant of motion, which is a very beautiful way. Beg your pardon? G is the constant of motion. F is the thing whose total time derivative happens to be the change in the Lagrangian. No. For a symmetry in general, the change in the Lagrangian should have the form of a total time derivative. And that f is not a constant of motion. The constant of motion combines f with the transformation itself, puts them together. OK? So I just like to mention this situation reminds one of the picture of a snake eating its own tail. As you start with the symmetry, you find a constant of motion, you find that the transformation is canonical, and that constant of motion generates the symmetry in turn, sort of returning the complement. So I think that this kind of well-rounded phase space description of Noether's first theorem is valuable as preparation for discussion of continuous symmetries in quantum mechanics. As you surely know, in quantum mechanics, your symmetries are represented by unitary transformations on Hilbert space. As operators, they are generated by the corresponding constants of motion, which are Hermitian operators and which stay up in the exponent. And it is these finite unitary transformations, which are symmetry transformations, which preserve the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. Okay. Now I go specifically to the second type of symmetry transformation in Noether's work, where arbitrary functions of x mu were uh, allowed to be present 
in the transformation equations. So in the case of uh, the simplified mechanics uh, situation, this means that we consider symmetry transformations in which arbitrary functions of time are allowed to be present. So I have to go back to equation nine. Uh, in this equation, delta q has, having this form or this form, up to now I assumed epsilon was a constant infinitesimal parameter. Now we go beyond this and we allow epsilon to be an arbitrary function of time. So we can imagine epsilon to be also written with t as an argument. Later I will generalize it one step further. So such gauge type symmetries of the Lagrangian, they automatically imply that the Lagrangian is a singular Lagrangian. What does it mean? I had defined a thing called the Hessian matrix, square symmetric matrix. And I had assumed up to now that that matrix was non-singular. Whenever you have a symmetry in which arbitrary functions of time are allowed to be present, you have a situation where the Hessian matrix is singular. Of course, the converse is not always true. You may have a singular Lagrangian, but it may not possess any gauge type symmetry. But I will not go further into that. Now, this general theory for handling singular Lagrangians and how to set up the Hamiltonian description for their dynamics and to analyze their dynamics in phase space, this was uh, created by Paul Dirac just before 1950. But I should be uh, a little more careful. As early as 1934, he had already presented some ideas in this direction in a short paper in a famous <laughs> journal called the PCPS. It is also the case that even earlier, 1930, Leon Rosenfeld, who was a junior collaborator of Niels Bohr, had done some work in this direction involving singular Lagrangians in the context of uh, uh, general relativity. But in Dirac's writings, the references to Rosenfeld are, are not there. Later, closer to the 1950s, Peter Bergman also worked in this area, and Dirac refers to him. So this, so I will now call this the Dirac theory. It's called generalized Hamiltonian dynamics, and the definitive paper is in the Canadian Journal of Mathematics in the year 1950. Some years later, he gave a set of very famous yeshiva lectures, 1964, uh, the title is Lectures on Quantum Mechanics, but the whole uh, set of lectures is about this problem in classical mechanics. This, this paper was based on a course of lectures which he gave at a Canadian mathematical seminar, which was held in 1949 at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And there are many very beautiful concepts presented in this paper of Dirac. I will sketch the main ideas uh, developed extremely briefly, just as much as is needed for my purposes to state the results which come from Noether's work for such systems. I should also mention Joseph Samuel's PhD thesis involved all of these ideas, and in his talk also these, these things will figure. Some of the questions which you may raise to me, I will reflect to him. So, for a, so let me give you a very brief description of the Dirac theory of constraint systems. So this is just preparation to tell you what Noether found in that case. So for a singular Lagrangian, here's a sketch of the treatment. You have a function L, the Lagrangian given to you, its Hessian matrix is singular, so it turns out that these equations imply that the momenta p are not all algebraically independent. This set of equations is given the name, the Legendre map. It is defined once the Lagrangian is given to you. 
So if it's a singular Lagrangian, the Legendre map leads to a set of algebraically independent restrictions on the Q's and P's. They cannot all be chosen as you wish, independent of each other. So these are called primary constraints. This name itself, I believe, was uh, suggested by Peter Bergman, and uh, Dirac uses it. In the statement of the primary constraints, I want to mention that the equations of motion have not been used. All that have been used are the equations of the Legendre map. So the constraints mean that in the phase space of the system, the point representing the state of the system at any given time must lie in that part where all these restrictions on Q and P or these constraints are obeyed. It cannot go away from that region in phase space. Okay. Now, Dirac, in his treatment, shows that the classical equations of motion, the Euler-Lagrange equations coming from the variational principle, can be partially translated into phase space for a singular system. And to begin with, they have a certain form. I'll describe it very briefly. There is what I will call an initial Hamiltonian, H0, which is the Legendre transform of the Lagrangian. And it so happens that it can be written as a function of the Q's and P's alone. Then the equations of motion, the classical Hamiltonian equations of motion for a singular system have a form slightly different from what you're used to. dq by dt is a Poisson bracket of q with h, 0, plus a set of terms in which you have Poisson brackets of q with each one of the primary constraints, and outside is an variable which is unknown to begin with, that is unknown at this stage. Similarly, the equations of motion for momentum have this Poisson bracket form, but we see again there is one term given by the Hamiltonian and other terms given by the constraints which you have at this stage. So the general equation of motion for any arbitrary function of all Q's and P's and time has first one bracket with H0, bracket with the primary constraints, and then the explicit time derivative. Now, in these equations, I have used something called the weak equation symbol. What this means is that at each stage, the equality holds, the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side, modulo the constraints that are operating at that stage. So these equations are to be taken, all of these, modulo phi equal to zero. All right. Now, as I said, this is the initial Hamiltonian. So in this whole treatment, the discussion of the equations of motion goes through a sequence of steps. First step, second step, third step. All of these are parts of an overall consistency analysis. And the idea is the following, that if the conditions phi equal to zero, the primary constraints have to be obeyed at all times, we must add to this initial set of equations of motion the condition d phi by dt must also be zero. Phi equal to zero at all times means its first derivative with respect to time must also be zero. So you start with these initial equations, add this set of requirements. Now the first term is a function on phase space. The second term phi sigma phi rho is a Poisson bracket of two constraints, and outside is this unknown variable which was not determined at this stage. In the uh, paper, the Vs are called the unknown velocities. I cannot go into more detail. Later in the tea break, if anyone asks, we'll try, Sam and I will try and clarify these things. So, the first stage of the consistency analysis is to add this set of requirements. This can lead to two kinds of consequences, more constraints independent of the primary ones, or some information on the variables v, which were 
completely unknown to begin with. If you get more constraints, go to the second step of the analysis. Demand that d chi by dt should be zero, which is this equation, 21. So constraints which appear before equations of motion are used are the primary constraints, phi. Constraints which appear after one use of the equations of motion are called secondary constraints. If they appear at the next stage, they are called tertiary constraints, and so on. So for any reasonable physical system, this consistency analysis must end after a finite number of steps. At the end of the analysis, here is the picture for the uh, dynamics, for the equations of motion. The initial Hamiltonian H0 changes to a certain final Hamiltonian, which I write as H. It is what you started with, plus pieces of the primary constraints which get added on during this process of a consistency condition. The constraints on the Qs and Ps are the primary ones, the secondary, tertiary, as many as are generated in the consistency analysis. And then you have a general equation of motion for any function of Q, P, and T. It is a Poisson bracket of F with H plus a set of terms which has a very special character. Certain combinations of the phi rho appear here. I write them as phi alpha. They come with coefficients V alpha, which are remnants of the original V rho, uh, which were here, which were here. So bits and pieces of those remain. And then there is the explicit time dependence term. So in, in, this, in this final equation of motion, the V alphas are those variables which remain arbitrary functions of time right at the end, up to the end of the analysis. So in the physics language, we can say, these are the terms in the generalized Hamiltonian equation of motion which describe gauge type transformations. So the phi alpha, they are very important. They are special linear combinations of the original constraints which survive up to the very end. And the V alphas are those coefficients which remain undetermined also up to the very end. So this is the structure of the final, the form of the final equations of motion, complete set of constraints. Now, this description of the situation at the end of the consistency analysis is described in a very beautiful way by Dirac in the following manner. He introduces the notion of a function being first class or a function being second class. A function on phase space is said to be first class if it's Poisson bracket with every constraint, whether it is a phi or a chi, is zero, modulo the constraints themselves being satisfied. So if a function is first class, f with phi rho is weakly zero, f with chi is also weakly zero. Otherwise, f is a second class function. So this is an important way of classifying functions on phase space, first class type, second class type. First class type, very simple behavior with respect to the constraints. So this idea of separating functions into these two classes can be applied to the constraints themselves. So in that way, you have a hierarchy of constraints, primary constraints, secondary, tertiary, and so on. Among the primary constraints, there are primary first class, primary second class. Secondary, secondary first class, secondary second class. Yeah. Why do we care about? Because they are there in a system which is a singular Lagrangian. Otherwise, we wouldn't have <laughs> spent all this effort. Huh? I have told you that many transparencies ago. I come back to it, not at this stage. A Lagrangian is singular if that Hessian matrix is singular. Because many physical systems are of that kind. That's why we care. OK. So now I want to tell you that 
the importance of this notion of being first class is the following. The final Hamiltonian at the end of the consistent analysis is always first class. That is first uh, one important consequence. Second thing is that the equations, terms in the equation of motion, which remain at the very end with arbitrary coefficients outside, they involve those primary constraints which happen to have the first class property. So in the final equation of motion, two things are true. The total Hamiltonian is first class, and each of these phi alpha is also first class. But of course, it is a primary first class constraint. So this nomenclature, which has come out of the Dirac uh, analysis of singular systems, now I can describe, so I have the right language to describe Noether's results uh, for such a system. It turns out that for a symmetry of a singular Lagrangian system, the analysis of the symmetry and the associated constant of motion goes through a similar step-by-step -step process. And at the end of the analysis, you have a final form for the constant of motion, which uh, Noether's theorem tells you is certainly there. So at the end of the analysis, here is what you find. This is now, so I have described in the previous transparency, the structure of the equations of motion in the final form, at the end of the analysis. Now I'm making corresponding statements for any infinitesimal symmetry. Here are the important facts. The constant of motion associated with any infinitesimal symmetry for a singular system, singular Lagrangian system, that is also a first class function. So this is a notion I have just introduced. The fact that the symmetry transformation is a canonical transformation can again be shown, an infinitesimal canonical transformation. Then you can ask, what is its generator? And for a symmetry, it is this constant of motion plus pieces involving the primary con uh, first class constraints, which were present in the equation of motion at the very end. So the same phi alphas primary first class, they appear in the final constant of motion generating the symmetry. It's a g plus phi alpha times some coefficients u alpha, which are in general not reducible to phase space functions. So this is the main thing about Noether's theorem for this kind, the second type of transformation where arbitrary functions of x are uh, involved. And so you can see in mechanics, you, by analyzing this system, you get very, very specific and clear results, which can then be translated back into the language of local field theory. And the last thing is to be uh, considered is the following. Suppose the symmetry itself is of gauge type. I had not said up to now that it was so. If so, then you get very, very detailed and specific results. And you remember I had uh, said that for this kind of gauge type symmetry, the parameter epsilon becomes itself an arbitrary function of time while it remains infinitesimal. So the first type of symmetry, infinitesimal symmetry I consider, is where the change in every q is proportional to epsilon, an arbitrary function of time, and it is multiplied by some given function of q and q, to, q dot. This is the first type. Second type, I generalize this one step, and this is needed for many physical cases, uh, electrodynamics, Yang-Mills, and so on. <clears throat> the change in the co coordinates q have terms proportional to epsilon, and also terms proportional to epsilon dot. So now the picture becomes more complete. If your symmetry of the Lagrangian, of the action, is of this gauge type, type one, or of this gauge type, type two, <clears throat> what are the specific statements you can make about the corresponding constant of motion 
which is guaranteed by Noether's theorem to be present. In the case of type 1, the constant of motion is also proportional to epsilon, as it is natural to expect. But it is epsilon of t, arbitrary function of time, multiplying a primary first class constraint. Now, it's a very beautiful point, and I will explain it in a moment. But I want you to, for those for whom this is new, I want you to appreciate this fact. See that the primary first class constraints have come back at the end of the story. The constant of motion involves them directly. If you have type 2, where the transformation involves not only epsilon, but also its time derivative, you have a little more detailed, more uh, complex structure for the constant of motion. There is a piece proportional to epsilon. Its coefficient is generally primary first class plus secondary first class. And for those who have followed me up to this point, only the primary first class appear in the equation of motion. Secondary first class are not present. Then there is, in the type 2, another piece proportional to d epsilon by dt. Its coefficient is primary first class. So I know that this is a little bit elaborate, but I did want to reach this point. What you have to appreciate is the following, that there is no escape from Noether's theorem. If you have a symmetry of whatever kind, it has associated with it a constant of motion. But what if is the symmetry itself is of the gauge type? It allows epsilon to be an arbitrary function of time. <clears throat> then the constant of motion must also be proportional to epsilon of t. <clears throat> so how can something preserve its value in the course of time which Noether's theorem says it must, if it is proportional to an arbitrary function of time. The only way it can do it is by being zero all the time. Then the fact that epsilon is arbitrary doesn't matter. So this is what, so you can say, the beautiful connection between infinitesimal symmetry and the corresponding constant of motion, which is the key part in Noether's theorem, here it tells you if the symmetries are the gauge type, the constant of motion has to physically be always zero, classically. Therefore, it has to end up being some combination of constraints. And this is exactly the kinds of constraints which appear in the final constant of motion. So you can see uh, one more thing which when students study constraint dynamics for the first time, they find it a little disconcerting. Here is a quantity which physically, from the numerical point of view, has to be zero at all times as you obey the equations of motion. But it is able to generate a non-trivial canonical transformation. How is that possible? Well, when you understand this theory, you see that these things are uh, consistent with each other. And you, in my mind, it is part of the beauty of Dirac's entire theory that all this can be taken care of. There is one last comment. I have just barely have time to mention it. There is one last development in the Dirac theory called the construction of what he calls a Dirac bracket. And it is a replacement of the Poisson bracket, which we are all familiar with. And the idea of the Dirac bracket is to have a way in which, out of all the constraints, the secondary constraints can be completely eliminated. Then when you switch from Poisson brackets to Dirac brackets, the only constraints which remain are the first class constraints. The second class are all eliminated completely in the algebraic sense. But it turns out that first class quantities are not affected by the passage from Poisson to Dirac brackets. That is a very important property of being first class. So what it means is that transformations of symmetries, including the Hamiltonian, final Hamiltonian, they are all of the first class kind. Therefore, for them, the passage from Poisson brackets to Dirac brackets 
which is a very important part of the entire picture created by Dirac, they survive this passage. All constants of motion from all infinitesimal symmetries survive the passage from Poisson to Dirac brackets. So I will uh, essentially stop at this point, just make a few uh, final comments. I am aware that to some of you, this excursion into Dirac's generalized Hamiltonian dynamics or uh, what is called constraint dynamics may have been a little bit uh, new and demanding, but this is the only way in which you can capture in the Hamiltonian spirit the essence of Noether's results. In Noether's paper, this part, the phase space, the Hamiltonian aspects are not dealt with. For, for transformation symmetries of the first kind she considers, depending on a finite number of parameters, the first part of my talk is, uh, is relevant. When you go to her second type of transformations where arbitrary functions of x appear, you have to go for the Hamiltonian version into the Dirac theory. So to get a proper, complete description of her results in this framework, this is uh, inescapable. So now for some final comments, which are partly historical in character. As I already mentioned to you, her work was completed by 1915, but published only in 1918. And as uh, we heard in the initial remarks, she was inspired by ideas of Felix Klein and David Hilbert in this whole approach to the connection between symmetries and conservation laws. As we also heard, Einstein's general relativity had come in 1915, and Hermann Weyl's concept of gauge transformations had come in 1917. And what was that? It was an attempt to unify classical Maxwell electromagnetism and Einstein's general relativity. And both in Einstein's work and Hermann Weyl's work, they involve the use of transformations in which arbitrary functions of space-time appear explicitly. That is why Noether, in her work, considered these two kinds of symmetry transformations, those depending on a finite set of parameters, those depending on arbitrary functions. And she also mentions intermediate cases. This fact, that is, these theories of physics were very new at that time, and they involved this arbitrary gauge type transformations, must have motivated her. Plus, a question which was posed by Hilbert on the problem of definition of general uh, energy in general relativity, which Professor Samuel will take up. So all this played uh, very important roles in her thinking. In her paper, Noether does say that there were earlier results by others in particular cases. And she mentions the results by Hamel and Herglotz. These are from the early part of the 20th century, opening years. Now, many of you know E.P. Wigner has written very extensively on invariance principles in uh, physics, both at the classical and the quantum levels. <clears throat> he always attributes the classical results to F. Felix Klein's school. And the names that he mentions are the names of Hamel, Engel, Herglotz, Besselhagen, all German, I think. In fact, Wigner gives credit to Hamel for having shown in 1904 that the basic conservation laws of momentum and angular momentum for physical systems are connected with the final fundamental symmetries of space and time, namely homogeneity and isotropy of physical space. Then, along with referring to Hamel, Engel, Herglotz, the Klein School, he also lists uh, Noether's work. However, in his writings, he does not particularly emphasize her work. I'm just mentioning this. Of course, his own work in the quantum mechanical framework is, of course, of fundamental importance. So let me conclude by saying that I suggest, that at least at the pedagogical level, the really beautiful general connection between continuous symmetry and conservation law 
conceived and brought out in full generality by Emmy Noether, should be presented, extended in the spirit of Hamilton. For Hamiltonian phase space in the absence of constraints and for the Dirac theory in the case of singular systems. Both are parts of the overall picture. And then you see that the symmetry triangle, uh, it, it is there right at the back, underlying everything, and you can then appreciate it. Then also the pattern of relationships for constraint systems comes out very nice, nicely. So let me conclude. I think this was timing me, right? <laughs> I didn't know. I, yeah. So my thanks again to Dr. Rukmini Day for inviting me to this meeting and for the chance to speak today. Thank you. Big pardon? The constraints, they are functions of P and Q. Yes. They are functions of P and Q. So it's an object integrated with the In the sense? Uh, and then combine with the expression. Integrate them meaning? Uh, I'm not quite sure. Yeah. So you have essentially an equation or a set of equations connecting Q and Q dot. So they are first first order I want to set of equations. Caution you. Yeah. There is a way to develop this whole theory for the singular case purely in the Lagrangian language, but we prefer not to do that. We prefer to switch to the Hamiltonian point of view as early as possible. So better you think of constraints as conditions on the Qs and the Ps. Don't think, it is better to avoid saying, I will substitute for P in terms of Q. Better not to do that. Just a Sometimes request. They, lead, they lead to some interesting facts, but any of you yeah, discuss. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>